next. Yes, clear. All right, great mind. So, hello, Salem. How are you? Okay, so let's start today by uh, just a quick revision about the ancient Greek. Okay. So, we have studied the ancient Greek civilization and we spoke about the Greece and everything about uh, the Greek people, uh, starting from the Greek thinkers, the, the artists, and also the writers. We have covered uh, a lot of uh, areas uh, here by speaking about uh, the philosopher. If you can remember, we have said that uh, most of the Greek people thought of uh, philosophers as uh, wisdom lovers. Wisdom lovers. They just loved wisdom and they just needed everything to be logic, everything in, in its uh, natural place. And consequently, they sought for perfection. So the past for of seek. Okay. So most of them tend to seek perfection via the philosophy and the logic. Okay. They also were very, very, very talented people by using their words and their rhetoric, which is the way they are speaking and expressing their themselves. Consequently, they could convince anyone by anything they needed, especially those of superstates. One of the uh, superstates was Socrates. While speaking about Socrates, we must know that he was one of the most important philosophers over the course of history. This man, he just needed to present the truth for people, that their society was corrupted one, and they need to stop the corruption in order to begin something good for the government itself and for the city itself. Because after all, we are from Athena to Athena. So, Scrit, he just tried to uh, use one of his best methods used to present truth, which was named after him the Socratic method. The Socratic method. In his method, he tends to just ask some questions, and the answer will lead the candidate to the ultimate truth that the country is corrupted and he needs to stop his corruption. Unfortunately, some of the corrupted men that like uh, did not like his uh, method. Consequently, they uh, condemned him for a trial, and in that trial, he was sentenced to death. Uh, he accepted his fate and uh, drank some poison. Uh, Plato, his student, on the other hand, fled Athens after uh, his uh, teacher, Socrates, was uh, killed. Uh, later, uh, he just fled Athens for uh, approximately 10 years, and once he came back, he opened school. Uh, that school he called the Academy, the Academy. In his school, Plato presented his teachers' ideas and methods by just trying to show people the right path. And while doing so, he just sought for the perfect and idealistic society. So Socrates sought for ultimate truth, and Plato sought for the idealistic society. In his ideal society, uh, Plato just presents for us three main categories of that perfect society. The first one are the workers, the second are the soldiers, and third are the philosophers. Of course, workers to do the work of the country, the philosophers in order to uh, run and uh, rule the country and the soldiers to defend them. And he approved on just one ruler, one ultimate powerful ruler, which must be a philosopher king. After Plato came his first student, Aristotle. Aristotle. So just, guys, if you just... Go back, go back, go back. Yes. So, Socratic, or Socrat, using the Socratic method, in order to pre uh, present truth. Teacher, I have a question. Yeah, after I finish, please. Then, as a student, Plato, see the sequence, okay, because the sequence is important. His student Plato, after him, you know, the color. Okay, so Plato, 
sought for the ideal society. And the ideal society contains three main categories, workers, philosophers, and soldiers. Later, after Plato, his student Aristotle also presented for us some of the most important books and literature, politics, art, and whatever, and of course, philosophy. Okay? So, from one student to the other student, one student, a teacher to the student, and from a student to becoming a teacher, to another student becoming a teacher, and so forth. Aristotle himself will later pass down the knowledge to his student, Alexander the Great. So over the course of history, guys, we come to counter that uh, most of the important figures all over the history they are sharing the same knowledge from one to the other from socrates seeking truth to plato seeking idealistic society to aristotle seeking perfection seeking wisdom seeking philosophy artist architecture writing teaching then he would pass down all of his knowledge to alexander and from his name alexander the great uh, one of the most important figures all over the course of history. Alexander the Great, uh, he died by the age of 32, by the way, when he was so, so young. Yet, still up till this day, he is to be remembered, and uh, people are still speak about him. Later, we have also spoken about the Parthenon, one of the architecture figures about uh, the Athenian people, and we said that the Ar Parthenon, a rectangular shaped temple, was made for the goddess Athena, which uh, the people of uh, Athens took uh, the name of their city from. Uh, also, we have spoken about uh, my beloved tragedy, the Greek tragedy. The Greek tragedy, they were meant to teach us to feel pity for the character, so that uh, we can learn from their mistakes and not uh, to fell in their mistakes. And tragedy means a concise tale that usually ends in sadness, sorrow, death, betrayal, committing suicide, etc. Okay? Can I have a question before? Now you can ask. Okay. We will take today uh, a lesson, the new uh, five. Five four, or we will continue revision. Uh, I'll just have uh, those two points. We, there is still two points that we did not cover: the Greek comedy and studying history. We did not cover that, so we will cover it uh, and just have a quick uh, presentation about uh, the next topic, which is speaking about Alexander the Great. Uh, and we will have that uh, tomorrow. Because uh, usually today you should have been presenting your presentations. Okay, so I'm just moving in a low pace because just uh, this topic will be included in the exam. So, once again, any question regarding what we have already studied? Uh, yes, uh, I have about Aristotle. Yes, what's wrong about okay. Aristotle? Cool. Um, uh, Aristotle, uh, so Plato wanted the ideal society and Socrates wanted the truth. What did Aristotle want again? Aristotle wants both the truth and the ideal society. And we can see all of that uh, via his uh, books, that uh, variety of books he left uh, for us, uh, including uh, his books you will find uh, that he has already spoken about uh, politics, about uh, democracy, about philosophy, and everything. And he also addressed the question of how people ought to live. So, again, seeking 
the ideal society. You need to live in a good place, governed by good people, ruled by good examples and idols, and following the true path for evolving and flourishing. So he just spoken about the golden mean, which is everything must be perfect, perfect in Italy. So the same principle actually that both as a teacher and his teacher before have already addressed Socrates and also Plato. So all of them, all of them seeking to. And just look at this. We have three important figures living, not uh, three, four. Uh, we will study Alexander next session. But uh, just imagine, guys, a teacher, so great, teaches his student Plato, and Plato teaches his student Aristotle, and Aristotle teaches his student Alexander. And four of them are still in our days considered to be a huge and magnificent example to be followed. Just imagine. So it tells us that once you seek truth, you seek the path of rightness, you will always be great and you will be idealistic one time. And we have four men living at the same period following the examples and the teaching of truth and perfection. So all of them were presented to us as magnificent figures. This is by example that is so thin. That's to be one of her photos as they say in Rome. Okay. Okay. Any questions so far? I think Nawaf had a question. Yes, Nawaf. I'm listening. Uh, one minute, please. Take your time. Yes, teacher. I am asking about uh, listen. Is talking about like a uh, person that is advocacy? Yes. Yes. Uh, all the person he's talking about is advocacy person. Bravo. Very good. Yeah. Very excellent. So, and now here triggers one of the best questions he has ever asked. Actually, I like his questions, actually. Sometimes he says some very, very good questions. So, he just tells me, okay, so, mister, you're saying that all of these characters, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, uh, uh, all of them were advocates. Yes, they were. Remember when we study advocacy? Well, advocacy, we say that an advocate always triggers some problems. When there is some problem, some uh, harmful situation from an institution or a government. And here the three of them are addressing the same problem, that of the the society, the government, the corrupted men, and they are gathering people, showing them the truth and the right path in order to just follow them, and later they can solve the problem of their society. So the three of them, yes, are advocates. Perfect question, now. Very, very good. Any other question? Okay, so we'll continue today to speak about uh, the Greek uh, comedy. We have mentioned the tragedy and we said that in the tragedy we have two kinds of tragedy. The first one was about uh, poetry and we have uh, the most important three figures in uh, the Greek poetry. Where, uh, they were Homer, Sappho and Penedor. The three of them presented for us some of the epic poems and the most important tales. Uh, in uh, our history. Later, we spoke also about another kind of uh, tragedy, which is uh, the playwriting. While the playwriting this is still famous uh, nowadays and to be followed for thousands of years uh, later by other people and other uh, other playwriters, uh, in their uh, playwriting, they introduced the problems from the past. Uh, problems from the past. Uh, mentioned this important point. So, while writing in tragedy, 
okay, in tragedy. Usually, the poet or the, the playwright, uh, they just uh, mention problems that happened in the past and they are addressing these problems in their writing. Consequently, we come to learn from them uh, in order to follow the right path and not to follow in uh, the same uh, mistakes uh, and not to end in sorrow and pain uh, like those characters. Uh, yet here to speak about uh, comedy. Comedy, on the other hand, it was a little bit different uh, from uh, that of uh, tragedy because comedy tends to make people laugh, right? Uh, but here, the source of laughing uh, that uh, the Greek people uh, made uh, was like of uh, a combination between laughing and sarcasm. Are you acquainted with the word sarcasm? Do you know sarcasm the is uh, like uh, a joke, but uh, yes, it's like a yes. joke, but, but like, like it's like sarcastic saying... humor. Yes, to say it's a humor kind of humor. Humor. at someone, and you are being sarcastic out of him to make people laugh at him. If we are speaking about a person, and which is forbidden, of course, in our religion. But here the idea. So the Greek uh, writers who wrote in comedy, playwriters, of course, and other novelists, while writing in comedy, they included issues from the present. So we come to one contradiction between the comedy and the tragedy, sorry. So again, in the tragedy, they spoke about problems and agony of characters from the past. Yet in comedy, they would write about the issues they are addressing right now in their society. And they are just portraying these issues in the form of humor, being sarcastic. So they would, for example, uh, we have a lot of corrupted men in our council of 500 in Athens, for example. So we would just in the play present the 500 people and there is a big issue and a threat for our society and yet they are uh, contributing with the enemy, taking money at the rectory or they are just eating and playing and neglecting their duty in order just to make uh, their uh, themselves very, very wealthy but the country will become very corrupted. So, in the comedy, they presented the humor to solve the problem of their present day issues. Okay, so again, one major figure and difference between poets, that comedy and tragedy. Tragedy addressed the past issues, yet comedy addressed the present issues. Okay. Okay. All right. Can you read, Yusuf, please, about Greek comedy? Greek yeah. comedy. Some Greek playwrights wrote comedies, humorous plays that mocked people or the, or was <laughs> the other part of the paragraph. Okay. Yeah. Or war against Sparta. Or past. Okay, all customs. Almost all the surviving ancient Greek comedies were written by Aristophanes. Aristophanes. In this, in this is Tarat, who names this? He shows the woman of Athens banned. And his book was called Lysistrata. Okay, he shows the women of Athens banding together to force their husbands to end a war against Sparta. Unlike tragedy, which focused on even events of the past, comedies ridiculed individuals of the day, including political figures and philosophers and prominent members of society. Through, through ridicule, comedy, com comic playwrights, Comic playwrights sharply criticize society as much as political cartoonists today do much as political cartoonists do today. All right. So simply to speak about uh, comedy, we need to mention that uh, we are speaking about uh, something that is uh, humorous, uh, something that make people laugh, uh, 
And of course, uh, for the Greek comedy, they mocked the people or even they mocked their own customs. So, so the custom they are practicing at that time or the people of that uh, time. Uh, one of the most important uh, comedy playwrights at that time was uh, Aristophanes. Aristophanes. Aristophanes is considered one of uh, the major playwrights in uh, the art or the uh, branch of comedy. He wrote uh, a book or a, a play, not a book, a play called Lysistrate. Lysistrate, and he, he just shows how the Athenian women are urging their husbands to stop the war against Sparta. Come on! Do you remember the war against Sparta? Yes, Athens was uh, Sparta, uh, against Sparta. Yeah, what was the, the war's name again? Trojan War. No. The Peloponnesian War. Peloponnesian War. So again, the Peloponnesian War was between Sparta and other yeah. Greek city against the Athens. Nice, nice. You just was about to fill the trap. Okay. Uh, the Peloponnesian War happened between two leagues. The Peloponnesian War happened between two leagues, not two city states, not between Sparta and Athens. No, it was between the Delian League and the Peloponnesian League. The Delian League was headed by Athens, and the Peloponnesian League was headed by Sparta. So we have city states fighting among themselves, but both parties were headed by Athens and. Sparta. Okay, so here in his uh, play, Aristophanes just shows us how the Athenian women, because they know that uh, Athens was faulty, the greedy people of Athens took uh, the treasury of uh, the uh, Delian leagues back to Athens and they stole the money, they started to uh, expand their territories and their uh, empire and they started to rebuild their own city regardless and neglecting other city states of Greek. So the women knew that uh, they are doing something bad. Consequently, they led to the war. So in his uh, play, Aristophanes shows how the Athenian women are trying to urge their husband, please stop the war with Sparta, come on. We are losing our life, we are losing our husband, we are losing, we are losing our freedom. And consequently, we will lose our country. So stop it. War will bring nothing but damage. But of course, he portrays all of this in a sort of humor, in a sort of ridiculous thing. Okay? So he's just triggering some of the present day issues, not like tragedy, past days issues. So, tragedy, on the other hand, focused on the events from the past so that we can learn from today. And of course, uh, including political figures, philosophers, you name it. Anyone who's doing anything bad, they will just include his character into a comedy. <laughs> and actually, this is still a practice today in our day. Like, for example, uh, Donald Trump. Yeah, he became very widely common as a cartoon figure. Right? Yeah, I mean, he's used in memes a lot. <laughs> yeah, he's being used. So, so far so good. Any questions so far? No. All right. The last point we will speak about today is studying history. Of course, we are studying world history. And to speak about those people, we must just point our attention to some of the most important figures of the course of history, which are the historians. Because without those people, we would have not knew anything about other civilizations. So one of the most important historians of the Greek civilization was Herodot. Herodotus. I believe you have heard the name before. In the ancient, the ancient Egyptian civilization, we have mentioned his name. He said that uh, Egypt was fully the gift of the Nile. Without it, it will become a plain desert. Recalling now? 
Yes, teacher, we remember it. Okay, so Herodot was one of the most important figures while writing about history. So those who write about history are called historians, yet Herodot is called the father of history. So we need to ask ourselves, why would we call this person, that's an scratcher of him, yes, yes, Abdurrahman, he was the father of history, and why would we call him the father of history? So let's see. Now, Af, can you read, please? Yes. The Greeks also applied observation, reason, and logic to the study of history. Herodotus is often called the father of history in the Western world because he went beyond listing the names of rulers or the retelling of ancient legends. Before writing the Persian Wars, Herodotus visited many lands collecting information from people who remembered the actual events he chronicled. In fact, Herodotus used the Greek term history, which means inquiry to define his work. Our, our history comes from this world, but its definition has evolved today to simply mean the recording and study of past events. All right. Herodotus, so, thank you very much. Stop just here to explain this. So, as you have mentioned at the beginning of the course, that uh, the Greek people have always sought for perfection. The Greek people have always sought for perfection. Yeah, perfection in life, perfection in philosophy, to perfection of the government, perfection of everything. Okay? Not only lifestyle. So, in order to speak about history, then they will seek perfection also. And what is the perfection of history? The perfection of writing history is observation, reason, and logic study of the history, okay? We will speak about life later, but concentrate here now, okay? So, to speak about the perfection of history, we will speak about the observation, to observe the events in front of you by your own eyes, to recognize them, to write them at, uh, in your events of your books, to seek reason, cause and effect, because logic, okay, why would a war happen to mention that? So, Herodot, he was called the father of history because he sought for all of these uh, idealistic uh, things while uh, writing about uh, history. Have you finished? Salim, Yusuf, yeah. Have you finished? I'm not finished doing writing. anything. Finish the uh, writing? Can we finish this part and then to speak about your concerns, Mr. D? Okay. So, once again, the Greek people saw perfection in every aspect of life. Uh, like uh, the history, they always uh, sought for perfection by observing, by uh, mentioning the reason and the logic uh, sequence of events and why would an event happen, okay? And put this in your mind. Why would an event happen? Like the Peloponnesian War, the Trojan War. They will always trigger these questions. Why would that event happen? Consequently, they can just draw a whole portrait for uh, the picture and come uh, to a logic uh, conclusion. So, for Herodot, uh, we name him or we call him the father of history because he was not like those historians who just write down some 
uh, events and uh, I asked Nawaf what happened in Nawaf yesterday. So Nawaf will tell me, oh, we went and we done, we have a uh, la 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 la. So I took what he just said and I write it down. And I'm a student guy. <laughs> I'm a stu no, of course he did not do that. Uh, no, he himself, uh, he went beyond the list of names, rulers, traveling, retelling, uh, Greeks legend, uh, uh, asking people, inquiring, uh, uh, why would something happen? And he just did not do that yet. Uh, he just uh, cast something we later called a critical eye. So I hit Salim. So he will just come and say, why would he hit Salim? He just tries to cast the critical eye on my action. Why would that happen? And later he will come, he comes to a common or a reasonable conclusion leading in his writing. So he went himself to the places which the Persian Wars have in the net. He visited them, he collected the information, and he later compared those tales he had gathered. Okay, so I would ask Salim what happened, then I'll go to Yusuf what happened, go to Nawaf, to Iyad, Abdurrahman, all of them. I'll just ask all of them and just compare all of these stories to get to the true one. So again, Herodot cast something that we call a critical eye to ask why would something happen and what is the cause of it and later the uh, result of that action uh, on his uh, source nothing pays uh, and conflicting accounts however uh, despite his special care for details and accuracy he had very special care for that uh, his writings reflects his own point of view of the war uh, that uh, was uh, a clear moral victory of the greek love freedom over the Persian uh, tranny, meaning that because the per the Greek people, they loved their freedom very much, more than the Persian loved to conquer other city states, they won at that war. He sometimes even invented conversation and speeches for his historical figures. Like while speaking about the Trojan War, for example, uh, what was Paris telling Helen while they were alone? Okay, so he would just uh, draw a whole conversation from his own imagination to try to present for us uh, the common events. And that's why we call him the father of history, because he just uh, moved beyond all other historians. Another historian uh, whose name was uh, uh, Saisudis, uh, who was a few years younger than uh, Herodot, wrote also about the Peloponnesian War between both parties. Uh, the Alien League and the Peloponnesian League. A much less happy subject for the Greeks, he had lived throughout the war, vividly described the war's savagery and corrupting influence on all those involved. Although he was an Athenian person, so he was born in Athens and lived there, yet while presenting historical facts and information, he tried to be as much as he was possible. So both writers, uh, Thaisudis and uh, Herodot, uh, are of the most important figure of uh, the Greek history. They stand for future historians. Uh, Herodot uh, stressed the importance of research. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Thaisudis uh, showed uh, the need of uh, or to avoid faith. Yeah, it's approximately time. Any questions so far? Um, so the first one, the who did yes, yes. Why? yes. Uh, so he was uh, more biased toward the Greeks, right? Yes. And the other guy, uh, they said this. Uh, he was uh, fair to both sides. He was what? He was, uh, he tried to be fair to both sides. Yeah, yeah he was uh, fair because he lived in the Athenian period while the Peloponnesian War. So, for example, let's just imagine now Saudi Arabia is having a, a war between, for example, uh, Egypt. Okay. And Saudi Arabia is the faulty party. But while we are living here in that period, we are becoming fair to both sides. So, we will just say that Saudi Arabia was fault or vice versa. 
Egypt is having uh, the war with Saudi Arabia and Egypt uh, is faulty. So, although that we are living in Egypt, yet we will say that Egypt was uh, the faulty party. So, uh, Thaisudis, he lived in Athens at the period of the Peloponnesian War. He was an Athenian person, yet he tried to be fair to both uh, sides in order to just present the facts. All right. Thank you very much, teacher. You are very, very welcome. Oh, no problem. Any questions so far? Do we have to?